Okay, so this session is going to be divided into three parts. So in the first one, I will try to give you some bird's eye view of what OpenStack is about and also what it can provide to you as basically users when you deploy it on in your like different for different clients or in your own data center. Then we will move to case studies and case studies, well, Mirantis comes with a couple of years of experience deploying OpenStack and we will walk you through a couple of deployments that we did for major companies and we won't be focusing on like, you know, very technically like core details of the implementations but rather than that we will try to show you how OpenStack can be utilized and how it can be modified to suit different needs of different companies. And in the very last stage I will give you the over that's what I told about the, at the very beginning. I will give you a short demo running all of this running on this laptop, fully working OpenStack Cloud automatically provision. And yeah, so let's begin. OpenStack capabilities. So I'll start with a question. Can anybody tell me what OpenStack is? Do you have a working definition? I don't want Frank you to answer because you're already know. All right, so. Probably everybody knows it's a huge buzzword right now, and everybody knows that it's some, it has something to do with clouds, and not those, and definitely not those clouds that are hovering over the hack today, but more more with cloud computing. And OpenStack Foundation, the guys who are actually governing OpenStack project, they have boiled it down to one sentence saying, OpenStack is open source software for building private and public clouds. This is a very superficial sentence, and probably everybody knows this open source software for building clouds. But let's take a closer look at this sentence and go to open source. So open source means that it's OpenStack is free and you can easily like grab the source code and modify, do whatever you want with it. But there are obviously trade-offs of open source. So on one side it's free, it's pretty cool, but as Frank said, it's in its very early stage. What does it mean? Uh, Frank described the story of playing with a network card adapter. So this is pretty much what's happening to OpenStack. I mean, there are multitudes of features being introduced <coughs> each couple of weeks. There are many different moving parts. There are many ways to achieve, like, you know, some configuration, some feature. And uh, you can do different things in different ways. But on the other side, it's really complicated. It's, well, OpenStack gives you some building blocks that you need to mix and match to form a working solution. And it can be tricky. It's, right now it requires some geeky knowledge, like the, at least this is like, you know, the opinion of many people. So this is the, the downside of OpenStack being open source. It's just complicated and it often lacks documentation for some new features. And speaking about open source, I mean, OpenStack as an open source project is not governed by any specific company. It's governed by OpenStack Foundation. And OpenStack Foundation consists of three boards or bodies, you can say. So the board of directors is, are the guys who just, well, basically their role is to get funding for OpenStack and promote OpenStack, organize OpenStack events, and make sure the whole political condition around OpenStack is proper for its further development. And there are three types of membership within this foundation, platinum, gold, and individual. And the membership type basically boils down to the amount of money that a given entity pumps into OpenStack. So if you pump huge millions, you're becoming a platinum member. If you are the member of the community, you just get, you are just represented by those individual members. And when it comes to the other groups, tech committee takes care about the technical leadership of the project. I mean, OpenStack is consisted of many components. Each of those components has a leader, project technical lead. And they are basically setting directions where the project should evolve. And this tech committee is a gathering of those project technical leads and they make sure they stay in sync so, so that different components do not interfere. They are good members of the whole OpenStack fam. And the user committee is just the voice of people, the operators who actually run OpenStack. So they keep, take care about the user groups, uh, events across, uh, across different countries. And it works like this. Uh, for example, when OpenStack operators wants to have some feature embedded, implemented within OpenStack, like you know, a new driver for a new hypervisor or for a 
new SDN platform. They, it, the request is just you know, uh, picked by the user committee and then passed to the tech committee so that the tech committee can actually drive its implementation. So you can say that the user committee is just the voice of people. If they want to have some feature implemented, this goes through the user committee. And when it comes to OpenStack growth, uh, this screenshot comes from stackalytics.com, which is uh, run actually by Mirantis and uh, provides real-time statistics about uh, all the commitments that people do to OpenStack. And I don't like, I won't be forcing you to just, you know, gaze on those, uh, on, on, on those numbers, but just to, uh, you should just uh, take a look at the names <coughs> of the companies that are involved. So you can see that OpenStack got huge attention from, uh, you know, uh, well-established companies like Red Hat, IBM, uh, Mirantis is also right there. Uh, and uh, right now, the number of contributors is reaching, I guess, 10,000. So you can see the, the scale of the movement. All right, so this is pretty much about OpenStack being open source. It's complicated, it's run by foundation, and it's getting huge. It's got huge backing. And when it comes from the, for the second part, private and public clouds, can anybody tell what's the difference, what differentiates public versus private cloud? Ready? Okay. So <laughs> I will present you a nicely looking picture. So this is a private cloud. I mean, uh, take a look at those guys in suits. They are pretty nice and good looking. And what? How does it correspond to to, to to a private cloud? So when you run a private cloud, you usually run it within your data center for your own company. This implies two things. I mean, you can you know what the applications are going to be that you're going to run on this cloud. So you can pretty much predict the workload that's going to hit your servers. And you can safely, I mean more or less safely, assume that even though you have different departments within the company, they will be acting together towards the same goal. So you don't need to strictly separate them. They won't be fighting against each other. So these are the requirements for private cloud, like you know, you can predict the workload <laughs> and you don't need to separate tenants, it's pretty easy. But when it comes to public clouds, the situation turns out to be a little different. So you don't know your users, <laughs> basically what you take care for is just the credit card numbers that they put into your, like, you know, and th they pay you on time, but you cannot tell who they are, what they are going to run, so you can end up pretty much running torrent server farms or just uh, some HPC workloads, some uh, and the web application will consume all the RAM on your server, so you cannot predict the workload, basically. And also, you could fall into a scenario of Pepsi versus Coke, where two competing companies run their infrastructures on your cloud, and you need to somehow ensure that they are separated and don't destroy one another. So you can see that the requirements for public clouds are much more serious, and when it comes to OpenStack, originally it was kind of primitive and was capable of only running private clouds, it had no proper tenant isolation, it, the resources, I mean the, the resource separations, the VM separations, network separations were not that good, but since a couple of releases, it introduced a proper authentication system, network overlays, so now you can say that it's pretty much capable of running public clouds. And, okay, right now I would like to introduce you the key concept of OpenStack, I mean, what features it can give you as a user. When you deploy OpenStack, what do you get? So the first thing that you get with OpenStack is IAS, basically infrastructure as a service. So infrastructure as a service is most, I can say, primitive way of cloud computing, the most basic. What you get as the result of running IAS cloud is an agile way, an API to spawn your virtual machines. So you can use a script to spin up like 50, 50 VMs in a row, utilize them and then tear them down. That's the whole point. Apart from VMs, you get also capability to provision additional block storage volumes to your instances. For example, when you run out of space on the root file system, you can always attach an additional block device. And OpenStack will manage all the network <coughs> so that your instances, when they boot up, they just don't end up being like without connections. Apart from this, there is also the storage as a service functionality. These two functionalities are totally disjoint. What does storage, storage uh, as a service functionality give you? I mean, 
Let me give you an example. On my laptop, I have a Google Drive application, which creates a virtual folder for me to which I can drag and drop files. But what happens under the hood? Those files are transferred to, to Google's infrastructure. And what I pay Google for is just to, ens to ensure that my data is always available and not lost. So if you want to provide your users just the same functionality, like you know, some remote storage that they can upload, upload their files to, you can deploy the storage as a service part of OpenStack. And those two IIS versus storage can be deployed totally independently, depending on what features you want to pick up from OpenStack. And what OpenStack provides on top of this? It provides two things. The first is common authentication and user interface. So you get one user interface for all those services, if you choose to deploy both of them. And an emerging trend right now is to use those building blocks underneath to create some platform as a service offerings. Well, example of platform as a service offering is, for example, database as a service. You, you, you tell OpenStack to create a database for you. And under the hood, it will spawn a couple of VMs, install MySQL, and will present return to you just MySQL connection string. That's an example of platform as a service. And technically, how these things are handled within OpenStack. So OpenStack is broken into so-called core, project, core projects. Each core project is responsible for providing some subset of functionalities for OpenStack. For example, IIS part is carried out by four core projects. And you have Nova, which, they, which basically talks to the hypervisor and spins up a VM. You have Neutron, which sets up networking, DHCP, gateway. And you have Cinder for attaching additional block devices to your instance. And you have Glass, because Glass, which serves you images, I mean, the VM templates, because you need to boot the <coughs> VM out of some operating system. So it can be QCOW, Red Hat image, or whatever else. And when it comes to uh, storage as a service, you've got only Swift project. For authentication, the name of the project is called Keystone. So Keystone service gives you the authentication. Authentication You connect to Keystone to authenticate yourself to OpenStack. And as the UI, one of the UIs, you can use Horizon, which is a web dashboard, the officially maintained by OpenStack Foundation. And an example of those, all of those things working together. So I'll just go right here and we'll try to show. So at the very, at the very, uh, uh, up on the slide, you've got Horizon, which is the UI for OpenStack. Okay, yeah, that's great. So at the very top, you have Horizon, to which you, as a user, connect. You spawn it in your browser. It's a web page, which gives you the UI to OpenStack. Obviously, before you start using OpenStack, you need to authenticate. And then, for example, you issue a VM provisioning request. I want to spin up one VM. So where does the request go? The request goes to Nova, which is responsible for spinning up VMs. But before Nova actually carries it out to the end, it needs to take a couple of steps. It first needs to talk to Glance to get the image template from which you will boot up your VM. And Glance, well, having a reliable storage for images is a kind of critical thing. So Glance will talk to Swift where the actual image is stored, will pull it out from Swift, and then pass to Nova. Well, what else should we have for our instance to become usable? Obviously, networking. So before the instance actually spawn, is spawned here, Nova also needs to go to Neutron service to provide um, a Neutron. What, what will Neutron return? IP address, default gateway, will set up, will plug in the instance to proper bridges on your hypervisor, do all the network related stuff. Once this is done, the VM can be booted and will be accessible for you over, over its IP. And if you run out of space, for example, on your root device, or you need to place some like, you know, large amount of data in a secure manner, you will contact Cinder to carve up an additional block storage device that you will attach to the instance. So here you can see how all those things act together to provide you the IIS experience. So in fact, you can, <coughs> even though OpenStack is just, you know, call it OpenStack, the IIS platform, you can see that there are many different blocks acting together. And each of those blocks, is developed by a different team of people. And examples of platforms as, platform as a service add-ons. Uh, so this is, for example, Heat, which is the counterpart of Red Hat's OpenShift. So you can just use a sing, provide a single template 
to, to build up your environment, like you know, your application on top of OpenStack. We have Savannah, which gives like with a single API call to OpenStack, you can boot up a fully functional Hadoop cluster on top of this IIS functionality. You have the Red Dwarf, which is database as a service. And you have Murano, which is kind of something like OpenShift, but for Windows-based data centers. So these are the examples of platform as a service add-ons, which are being developed right now. They are not considered stable projects, but are being incorporated in the, you know, into OpenStack soon. OK, so this is the end of part one. So main takeaways from, for you from part one is just knowing that OpenStack is open source, complicated, build, like, you know, many building, small building blocks like Linux in its early stages. It's governed by a foundation. It offers IIS plus storage as a service. Com it comes with a single sign-on to, to those different services and comes with a web UI. This is pretty much it. Okay, and the next part is going to be about how we, yes? What kind of open source license is it? Is it Apache UI or is it more controls? Yeah, it's Apache as far as I know, Apache 2.0. Yes. Okay, so right now, customer case studies. Uh, now I will show you how those things, how we managed to, uh, how Mirantis managed to uh, implement OpenStack for a number of, uh, well, large companies and how those companies benefited out of it. And I will show you how. We, would, we were able to tweak OpenStack to just tailor the solution to those companies' needs. And the companies we are we're talking about are WebEx, Codonis, Gap, and PayPal. So let's start with WebEx. Uh, WebEx is a is an online collaboration company. Pretty much it boils down to uh, video conferencing and meeting recordings, like collaborative note-taking. They are a part of Cisco right now. So. What was their business driver to move into OpenStack? Uh, primarily agility, which means that they needed their infrastructure to handle the spikes of load, provision their additional resources quickly, and scale them down when uh, they weren't needed. And th another thing is they need, it needed to be a cost-effective solution. So OpenStack is free, why don't we use it? And they were also considering some other options, like going into AWS. It's, well, given the outages that they suffered at that time, it was uh, kind of out of scope for them. And uh, at some scale, Amazon turns costly. So they figured that out and said it was not an option for them. They found VMware not to be flexible enough, and obviously you need to pay VMware for the licenses, so the, the, they, they didn't want to use it. And they had a whole bunch of Cisco gear running, like UCS blades plus uh, some load balancers, and they want to plug, wanted to plug OpenStack into those devices. So what we provided for WebEx was deployment automation, which means that we uh, used Puppet uh, configuration management to roll out OpenStack clusters across data centers. We provided, like each data center was running an independent OpenStack installation. And we wrote a middleware for Swift to uh, encrypt the objects before they are actually stored as uh, uh, on, the, on the Swift cluster. Because there was, uh, well, meeting recordings, like for business meetings, are usually confidential. So before they get stored in Swift, they need to be encrypted. That's, that was our custom part. And this is the high-level overview with those smiley faces being users of uh, how <laughs> this, this whole thing worked out. So basically, we have two data centers, each one runs independent OpenStack installation. We integrated OpenStack with Active Directory, which is pretty easy. And for logging, we use Splunk. Each of those clusters has separate monitoring based on Nagios. Nagios is not a part of OpenStack. It was our, well, Mirantis provides uh, custom checks for different OpenStack services. And the most interesting part was the Swift cluster, which was basically spanning across two data, center, data centers. I mean, you know that Swift is all about storage as a service, the Google Drive-like functionality. So it's all about your data the resilience. And Swift runs on a cluster of servers, and it achieves data resiliency through replication. So we, need to, we needed to ensure that in case, well, each time user uploads the object to Swift, there are two replicas in two distinct data centers, so that one, if one burns down totally, you can still have replicas in, in the spare. And 
So how did would did WebEx benefit it out of uh, of OpenStack? So they can spawn roll out OpenStack in new data centers very quickly, in matters of hours. They have already migrated their initial set of internal applications to OpenStack. And what we see they are scaling it out dynamically because there is an ongoing interest to, among different departments of Cisco to just start using this. When it comes to Codonis, this is a hosting, this company runs a hosting platform for life science companies that do lots of computations plus healthcare. And their main driving factor to OpenStack was that they, they wanted to lower the prices of their offerings. They originally they were running on VMware and they needed to include the price of the license into their uh, into their pricing. Moving to OpenStack would just would just drop it down. As constraints, Codonis was running a very specific types of workload. There were two factors coming into consideration. One was that they were running, like life sciences is all about HPC and lots of calculations, which is not a good candidate for being virtualized. And another was HIPAA compliance. I mean, there were companies processing medical records. And if you process medical records in the US, you are to follow some standards, which are basically outlined in HIPAA. And one of the requirements is that tenants need to be like separated over diff different groups of users, different companies using the cloud needs to need to be separated over different sets of hardware. So if company A lands on a given hypervisor, on hypervisor A, the other company would not come to that hypervisor. So what we did for Codonis, is basically we implemented a bare metal provisioning functionality. So we gave OpenStack <coughs> ability not to provision only VMs, but also provi provision bare metal servers over Pixie. And we also modified OpenStack scheduler to fit the scenario of tenant isolation that if a HIPAA compliant tenant op occupies hypervisor, one hypervisor, the other tenant with HIPAA compliance needs to occupy totally, uh, totally other hypervisor. And this is pretty much the depiction of all the stuff that we implement. Nova API is the contact endpoint, the UI for OpenStack basically, the API endpoint, and we deployed a number of servers constituting a shared pool, like everybody can use them, everybody can spawn their instances, which come with no, no really, like no, uh, which come with no security requirements. And for HIPAA compliance uh, uh, tenants, we provide proper resource isolation. So each one of them got its own of, own set of hypervisors plus bare metal nodes. And the outcome for Codonis was that Providence one of the major healthcare providers in the US moved to OpenStack and started using it. And we took, together with Codonis, we took the bare metal driver, the one that actually allows you to spin up ins bare metal instances and committed it back to upstream. Okay, next company, Gap. I mean, who's wearing Gap t-shirt or hoodie right now? So they are a very popular clothes shop. And uh, yeah, well, <laughs> all beat. Yeah, so if you don't have them right now on you, then you have them at home probably. Or if you don't know what what Gap is, yeah, probably your wives know already. Yeah, so Gap is is like you know major clothing company, and what they own is actually multiple brands, and each multiple brands has a, is a separate like small application, a web small web portal. So they wanted to like unify them all running on the same infrastructure to load the TCO. And obviously another requirement as usual for like, you know, bringing down the cost of the whole solution. And initially what Gap wanted to be moved to OpenStack was just a web layer for, for those shops. Which means that, well, if you deploy an, a web application it's usually hidden un under some load balancer, a web server farm. So we needed to provide a way to automatically insert those newly created instances on top of OpenStack as the pool members to load balancers. So what we did, we wrote a driver for F5 Big IP. So once a virtual resource on top of OpenStack is provisioned, it will automatically be inserted into the pool, to the load balancing pool. We all, Gap was also running a zoo of their own, of their own internal 
techno technologies which were not part of OpenStack, like Infoblox for DHCP and ICL for storage. So we also wrote drivers and uh, OpenStack didn't use its internal DHCP services, but other than that, it was contacting Infoblox to generate proper reservations for, uh, for the VMs. And obviously, if you wanted to go to uh, create yourself an additional block volume for your instances, you, we implemented a driver which talks to ICLON and carves up the proper space and sets up iSCSI target. And we use Chef for configuration management. Uh, this is pretty much the depiction of what we implemented. There is an example of application that, you know, there is a price lookup application so that cashier in stores looks up goes to the loss balancer and goes to the application, which is the, to, the, to the VM, which is provisioned by OpenStack and automatically uh, put, put into the load balancer pool. And VMs use in, info blocks to uh, obtain their IPs. For monitoring, we use Nagios. And for additional block storage, we used, we wrote a custom ICLM driver. And what GAP did with this, um, <coughs> They ran, where they started running in, in production uh, in late 2012, and this time we took the load balancer driver, committed it upstream. Okay, PayPal. I won't be asking if anybody knows because it's obvious. So, yeah, PayPal is like a major payment processing platform, and for PayPal, the business driver was like this: they were running over 9,000 servers on VMware. And at some point in time, they bought new servers. And when they calculated the price of the uh, licenses they would need to pay VMware, they just you know, said no, and let's turn to OpenStack. And what we implemented for PayPal was the following. Uh, we automated OpenStack cluster rollups using their information for configuration management database. We also wrote a custom load balancer for them. And PayPal has its own internal DNS service, and there was a requirement for new instances to <coughs> appear in this DNS servers automatically, so we wrote a proper driver. And here, here, it, here is how it actually uh, looks like. Okay, so you have three data centers with common tooling, like for rolling out OpenStack clusters based on Puppet. So Puppet governs the configuration of OpenStack clusters here. Also, we have a monitoring framework, which was originally based by uh, based on Nagios, but right now it's being moved to Zabbix. And also, we provision we provided the ability for VMs to automat automatically be plugged into a load balancer plus update entries in PayPal's corporate DNS. Okay, so this is pretty much all about the. This is the the end of part part two. And for you, it's, I mean, for the main takeaway for you uh, is from this part is not just uh, a bunch of technologies, but rather than, rather than that, a vision of how OpenStack can, how different companies can benefit from OpenStack and how it can be tweaked or improved very easily because it's open source, like, you know, custom drivers can be written, stuff like that, to actually tailor this solution to specific customers' needs. OpenStack can turn into actually anything if you write if you write proper drivers. Like you can deploy bare metal, it can talk to DNS, to, to like so, some proprietary DHCP services, pretty much anything. Okay, so right now a couple of words about OpenStack deployments. So you remember this slide from the very beginning. So let's revisit that. I mean OpenStack right now is like a Linux in its early days. It's just Lots of many moving parts with geeky knowledge required to set them up, and lots of time needs to be spent if you install it manually before you actually reach out to the production grade cloud. And Mirantis found at some point in time a niche for a solution where actually you can streamline this process. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so, doing manually, you can pretty much end up having like, you know, reading the instructions, even if you read the manuals for OpenStack, they tend to be confusing. You don't know the best practices yet, and you might end up having something like this. By the way, I know this car is very popular here. I mean, some people just use it for tuning and stuff like that. So, yeah, it comes from Poland, from my country, actually, and many, like, you know, people from the Netherlands come and bring it up. <laughs> it's, this one doesn't come from the Netherlands. 
So yeah, so you are if you if you configure manually, there is a chance that you will end up like this. You'll be having something that's actually drop, you know, running, but not exactly looking like as it should. So we figured out that there is a need for a <laughs> toolkit to generate and fuel. I must uh, say at the very beginning is not a proprietary solution. This is not going to be like a marketing speech. It's open source, so it's more like to uh, incentive to give you in an incentive to just grab the code and you know figure out how it works and contribute to make you know something like Red Hat is. And yeah, so what fuel provides? Basically, it provides you a control plane, a web portal that you can use to actually deploy OpenStack, to create different architectures of OpenStack. And, well, it takes into consideration Mirantis Trier's expertise, so if you, if you get stuck with it, you have a you know, um, pretty much chance that your deployment will be done right. And you don't need to like uh, worry about which components need to be HA, which not. How do I just spread all those components and demons across my hardware set? It's just done and planned for you. So how it works? First, well, the, the whole idea about uh, fuel is like this. You deploy one node to be the fuel management node, one server. Then you plug it into a rack of servers, which are not installed at all. You turn them on and they pixie boot from this fuel management node and get discovered by it. And you get, and you get them registered in this fuel, fuel portal. Then you choose the, the operating system. Right now we support Red Hat and CentOS. You choose the topology of OpenStack you want to deploy. You assign different machines different roles. Click deploy button and it's done for you. So this looks pretty easy. I mean, it's not really <laughs> documentation and putting it all together. And Fuel actually deploys two architectures that we at Mirantis kind of treat as standard deployment modes for OpenStack. One is very basic. I mean, OpenStack large runs on the clusters of servers. So you have a number of compute nodes which are basically hypervisors. These hypervisors are controlled by so-called cloud controller component. This is the beast that holds, like keeps all the state of the cluster. Uh, this is the also, it exposes API endpoints to which your users connect to spin up their resources. If you lose this controller node, your cluster is down. If you lose MySQL data, con which, uh, which is uh, present on this node, you end up with a bunch of VMs not controlled by anything. So this you can see that this simple deployment mode is kind of for evaluation because you don't provide HA for this component at all. And the other most more sophisticated deployment is that you have three cloud controllers to provide proper HA. So we have HA for MySQL database, which is based on Galera, the multi-master replication, which is and is synchronous. You have AMQP cluster to, to just to, for HA of the message passing. I mean, OpenStack components connect with each other using MQP, which the, message, the messages uh, uh, go, flow through some sort of broker application. So we need to provide HA for this broker. In case of RabbitMQ, it's RabbitMQ cluster. And we use Pacemaker, Coursing, plus HA proxy to manage all the OpenStack demons and handle failures of the node. So if this node fails, Coursing and, H, uh, Coursing and Pacemaker were kind of uh, excluded from the pool and move the workload to those, to those two. And HA proxy is used to load balance those things. And these two topologies are deployed by Fuel automatically out of the box. So we can choose between those two. Then this one is dedicated for large scale deployments, production grade. You can actually run a production grade OpenStack cluster based on this architecture. And right now, the most tricky part of this presentation, I will show you a working Fuel demo. So, let me just switch back from this presentation and bring up my environment. So what I have here is a couple of nodes. Fuel Webmaster, which is my fuel management node, the one, the one that exposes a nicely looking web application. And I got a couple of slave nodes, which pretend to be, which are the nodes onto which I'll be dropping OpenStack with fuel. And yeah, okay, so let's move to, uh, well, and they are all based on my laptop, the virtual box. 
So let's move to a fuel portal. This is the sleek UI that is presented to you when you start, when you deploy, when you run the fuel management node. And you can see that you have support for many releases. Right now we deploy OpenStack Grizzly, which is latest stable on CentOS, and, uh, and we deploy Red Hat OpenStack on Red Hat 6.4. And to configure Red Hat support, you need to just insert, it's as simple as inputting your Red Hat network user data. Okay, so let's switch back to environments and create a new OpenStack environment. This OpenStack environment will be constituted out of these three slaves right here. <coughs> let's paste, let's name it. <coughs> and we will set Red Hat OS to be cloud platform that, that we want to deploy. And you can see that Fuel gives us opportunity to create multiple OpenStack environment. Like, you know, you run multiple data centers, you can create for each one a separate environment. All right, so let's click on it. And here, before you actually start, you have a chance to tweak networks. So you can assign different VLANs, depending on which numbers you have supported. You can also test if the network, the network connectivity between the members of the cluster. You can also adjust some OpenStack specific settings like admin passwords, and you can s collect logs from cluster members and provide some, well, run some health checks. I'll be talking about it later. But let's get back to those machines right here. That's one thing that I, I forgot to tell you about. Initially, they are pixie booted from the Fuel Master node, and what they are booted to is actually a small operating system called Bootstrap. It, totally loads into the RAM and it runs some agent that talks back to fuel management node and saying hello here I am you can use me to provision OpenStack this is basically uh, it and here is where we can choose the topologies right now you can see I have this dotted box right here allows me to choose only one OpenStack controller the, the central management point for OpenStack but I can easily switch from multi-node to multi-node which with HA which will allow me to roll out an HA redundant cloud controller consisting of three different hardware boxes with Galera on top and uh, Chorusing slash Pacemaker, all the full blown features. But I will stick to multi node because my laptop will melt down if I run more than, uh, than those three machines. So let me now just add them. Like this one will be the controller node. And I will also add one compute node, which will be the hypervisor that will host the VMs. And I will add another node to be to provide the block storage functionality. And you see that I have three total nodes, zero unallocated, which means I already utilized all the available nodes. And then I click deploy changes. Now keep your fingers crossed. So within a couple of seconds, uh, this one not, but the other ones should actually start rebooting. And you see that right now, right here, you have a, you have a progress bar saying installing, installing Red Hat. What will be done under the hood? Pixie installation, network installation of Red Hat will be done on, along with a proper kickstart provided. And on top of this delivered Red Hat, OpenStack will be dropped out. So you can see right now that those are rebooted, the slaves are being rebooted, and they are booted from a Pixie server. But this typically on my laptop takes half an hour, so now <laughs> what I will do, I will try to be like Captain Picard in like, you know, Enterprise spaceship and try to like, you know, achieve warp, warp speed. What I will do, I will turn off all these nodes and restore restored this, them from this snapshot where I have the situation where they are all deployed. So it will take like up to three minutes. So let me just uh, turn them down. Okay. Okay. 
move to the proper snapshot, all of them. So I can install. What I will need to do, I will also need to reboot the slide. So let me do that and I will get back and continue with the presentation until all of those nodes are built. Let's wait for it, and in the meantime, continue with the <laughs> lecture. So, okay. Speaking about fuel, how you can get it? Uh, there was a nice website called fuel.mirantis.com where you can actually download uh, the whole solution and obviously get support from from us, which is very good, by the way. And <laughs> And yeah, so what you got on this web page is support, yeah, and also free ISOs pre-built, and we also come with a nice demoware, which I actually use to provision this, this demo. There's a virtual box script that creates four VMs and deploys something like I, what I showed you already. So if you want to, like, you know, your boss to take a look at OpenStack, but you don't have, like, time to wait for servers, you can just grab those scripts and provision all the OpenStack working installation within your laptop and come to your boss and say, look, it's that easy. So, and uh, <laughs> apart from this, uh, if within a month, if you email me, guys, and download, happen to download, come to fuelnerratives.com and download all the stuff, you will get one month of free support from our support team. Just remember to shoot me an email on this. And as I told you, OpenStack, well, Fuel is not only like, you know, an ISO plus virtual box. We are actually available on Stackforge, which is a, a container for all OpenStack related projects. And we host the code on GitHub. So once you just download the ISO play with it, feel free to grab the code from GitHub and commit patches and work with us together. OK, so let's get to, to those to those uh, servers right here. You can see that right now we've got green success. Yes, we made it. And what actually Fuel presents us with are two URLs to, that we will use to connect to our OpenStack cluster. So just to prove that OpenStack is actually running, a little bit, you can see that it's a nice Opus Horizon, this is Horizon, the UI for OpenStack. It comes with a nice Red Hat logo, which is because it is Red Hat branded. And I will use admin credentials to log into it. Actually, you can see it is working. So I will now spawn an instance. It comes with a test VM pre install so they can test it right after it's deployed. Name it test, and it should be ready to go. I won't be spawning anything else because my laptop is kind of will collapse under this load. Yeah, it will take a couple of seconds, and you can actually see that OpenStack is working. We provisioned the first VM. Going from zero to hero, like, you know, from the plain uh, fuel web console to this state where you have OpenStack rolled out, on my virtual box typically takes, like, up to half an hour. So this is a pretty much <coughs> easy, easy thing to do. And 
Another interesting thing, I mean, oh, Fuel is not only about rolling out OpenStack. It comes with some management capabilities that we are constantly expanding from release to release. Right now, for example, you can collect, collect logs from different OpenStack, I mean, from different nodes, from different daemons. So I'll just go other servers. We see that under the hood, Puppet is used to configure actually all this OpenStack stuff. And you can have different sources of logs to look for. You can display logs from different components. Very interesting functionality. I think it's like you know a killer functionality actually. Is possibility once you roll out OpenStack, is a possibility to test it. So Fuel comes with a bunch of unit tests that you can spawn from this GUI, and they will give you the answer that if something has been wrong on the way, or if you have a fully working like all the deployment was totally successful. I mean, you have some small tests here and some sanity tests, which typically take less to run, so I will choose them. And if you go and run the test, you will see like green thumbs up. And since I have some connectivity problems from here, from my VirtualBox environment, those two things probably won't execute normally, but let's see. Like DNS and internet connectivity. But this is only specific to the setup I run, so this is not real. So this is only like you know happening within this demo. Yeah, here it sh should fail, and the last one should su succeed. Yeah. Google. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much rely on Google, yeah. and also rely on cdn.redhandle.com if we deploy Red Hat OS. That will I figured out when I you know, tested the demo here. All right. Uh, so this is pretty much it about Fuel. You see that it actually works. And we encourage you to just you know take the source code. And yes. Um, just to make sure I understand fuel, right? Um, you're running version books as the hypervisor to deploy. Yes. Another yeah, and I'm using QMU inside those virtual uh, machines to provision uh, to provision uh, VMs. So it's not effective as fuel emulation. Okay. Once I use uh, once I use have used fuel to deploy OpenStack nodes, I. Yeah really don't need fuel any longer, or am I mistaken? Uh, yes, you could just leave it as it is. But you need to know that fuel is also puppet under the hood. So you can pretty much manage your environment and tweak it to your needs by like, uh, going to the command line of fuel and modifying puppet manifests. This is how you can further manage the whole environment. So apart from the UI, fuel also comes with some like you know, advanced capability. You can you know go under the hood and play around with puppet manifests, and you can pretty much implement whatever you want. But there's no overlap between fuel and the functionality provided by OpenStack itself. No, it's just a management platform, a tool to streamline deployment of OpenStack and provide some certified deployment. I mean, the architecture that is guaranteed to work and scale. All right, so. <coughs> Let's get back to the slides. So this is pretty much it for today. Like, uh, I encourage you to uh, grab fuel, some fuel for yourselves right now, since it's going to be a lunch break. And once it's done and you are full of energy, you can just you know grab the code and uh, make your commitments and work on the fuel together. <laughs> There is no equivalent for KPM? Well, it's designed to be rolled out on physical servers. So definitely, this is demoware. This is only suitable for, like, virtual box is suitable only for demo. Typically, you deploy fuel across your data center on, you know, bare metal racks. If I uh, understood the demo correctly, you use satellite to install uh, bootstrap the servers? Um, Technically, I need to figure it out. Uh, so I don't know the details of how Red Hat OS is installed, but I can definitely give you know, contact to, to a guy who is actually managing that. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Thank you very much.